we continue with the example of uh, fully developed flow through a circular pipe and uh, we in the last class arrived at the simplified forms of the governing equations. So, let us continue with the governing equations which are written here. Uh, first, let us consider the R momentum equation. So, in the R momentum equation, first of all let us see that what is this B R? B R is the body force component uh, in the radial direction. There is a body force component in the radial direction that is true, but until or unless this extent of the pipe is very large, it is like a very uh, high radius pipe, then that effect of that body force is not going to be important along the R direction. So, this therefore may be neglected. So, you come up with <coughs> the pressure gradient along R equal to 0 or approximately equal to 0. That means, P is not a function of R only, not a function of R. That means, P is a function of Z only. <coughs> so, you can write when you come to the Z momentum equation, this as dP dZ and <coughs> you may combine that term with the body force term to have d dZ of P plus rho g z sin theta is equal to mu into 1 by r d dr of r d v z dr. Because v z is a function of r only that we uh, showed in the last class, therefore it boils down to an ordinary derivative. So, this P plus rho g z sin theta is like p plus rho g h. So, this is like p star the piezometric pressure. We again uh, are having an equation where you have d p star d z is equal to mu into 1 by r d d r of r d v z d r where the left hand side is a function of z only, the right hand side is a function of r only. So, this is function of z only, this is function of r only and again this may be valid if each is a constant. So, each equal to constant <coughs> say equal to c. So, uh, the first thing that we may do is to find out the velocity profile from this. So, we consider the right hand side and uh, integrate it. So, you have d of r d v z d r is equal to c by mu r d r. Right. So, this you may integrate. So, once you integrate you have r d v z d r is equal to c r square by 2 mu plus C 1, which means d v z d r is equal to C r by 2 mu plus C 1 by r. Okay. So, you may integrate it once more. So, if you integrate it once more, you will get v z as a function of r. So, let us do that. So, you have v z equal to C r square by 2 mu plus C 1 ln r plus C 2, sorry 4 mu yes, 4 mu plus C 1 ln r plus C 2. Now, C 1 and C 2 are the constants of integration that we have to find out from the boundary conditions. So, what are the boundary conditions here? Boundary conditions. So, one of the boundary conditions that is at the wall is straight forward at small r equal to capital R you have v z equal to 0 no slip boundary condition. Then what happens at small r equal to 0 that is a point of singularity so to say and but physical problem is that v z has to be defined at small r equal to 0. I mean you you cannot have 
a situation where there is Vz undefined at small r equal to 0 because it is a physical problem the pipe is entirely filled up with a fluid with some velocity at r equal to 0 there it should be a well defined velocity and that is possible. So, Vz is at r equal to 0 Vz must be finite it cannot be infinite or it cannot be undefined in, in other words. Therefore, from the second condition you must have C1 equal to 0 this is from the boundary condition number 2 and from the boundary condition number 1. So, this is boundary condition number 1 and this is boundary condition number 2. So, from boundary condition number 1 you have 0 equal to C r square by 4 mu plus C2 that means C2 is minus C r square by 4 mu. So, the velocity profile becomes V z equal to C by 4 mu into or if we write minus C by 4 mu into capital R square minus small r square right. And as usual you see that the C which is like d p star d z that has to be negative to drive the flow along the positive z direction which means that v z has to be positive if c is negative. Now you may express c in terms of the average velocity what we did uh, for the plane Poiseuille flow for the Hagen Poiseuille flow also the same thing is valid. So, what is the average velocity v average it is integral of v z over the area of cross section divided by the area of cross section. So, v z what is the area of cross in what is the elemental area that you can choose say at a distance r you take a strip of width d r. So, if you if you just draw its other view. So, you have taken at a at a radius r some strip. We are talking about such a strip of width dr, and this strip is 2 pi r dr. So, Vz into 2 pi r dr from 0 to capital R divided by pi capital R square is the area. So, let us do this integration quickly. So, 2 into integral of 0 to r you have minus c by 4 mu so what is v average in terms of c so minus c by 2 mu then <coughs> you integrate it r square so r 4 by 2 minus r 4 by 4 by pi r square sorry pi is not there pi has got cancelled so this is equal to minus c r square by 8 mu. So, this is one important result which we will use subsequently, but at least uh, let us write the expression for the velocity profile by writing c in terms of this. So, v z becomes in place of c you write minus 8 mu v average by r square that into 1 by 4 mu again there is a minus sign into r square minus small r square that means v z by v average is 2 into 1 minus small r square by capital R square this is the velocity profile in terms of the average velocity. Recall uh, the flow between two 
parallel plates, it was like 3 by 2 into 1 minus y square by 8 square. So, it is quite similar. The coefficient is different just because of the different geometry and uh, it is also a parabolic type of velocity profile because it is square with the local radius. Now, you can find out the what is the wall shear stress. So, let us find out what is the wall shear stress. So, it will be like mu, we will adjust the sign positive or negative later on, mu into the rate of deformation. This is like tau Rz. proper subscript with the index. Now, one of the important things is see uh, positive tau with a like mu du dy. So, this is like just like mu du dy. First of all, vr is 0. So, this term is not there. So, it is just like mu du dy, but the thing is see the r direction is towards the solid boundary. It is not away from the solid boundary. So, that has to be compensated with a minus sign here. So, if you have a solid boundary like this, if you have this as y, then you have like d u d, mu d u d y. So, y is away from the solid boundary towards the fluid. The reason is you want to write it as a positive shear stress. So, you want u to be increasing in the y direction. So, y equal to 0 is like the no slip and then u increases, but here the r direction is opposite to that. So, you have to make it up with a minus sign. <coughs> So, uh, the wall shear stress therefore, uh, if you just differentiate it with respect to R, so d v z d r is like 2 v average. So, this entire thing evaluated at small r equal to capital R that is at the wall, wall is located at small r equal to capital R. So, 2 v average into minus 2 So, minus 4 V average by R is the D V Z D R, right. Therefore, the wall shear stress is 4 mu V average by R. What is the coefficient of friction or the Fanning's friction coefficient that is tau wall by half rho into V average square. This we introduced in one of our previous classes, this friction coefficient. It is a non-dimensional way of writing the shear stress. So, it is 4 mu V average by R, basically it becomes 8 mu V average by R rho V average square. So, it is 8 divided by rho V average R by mu. The denominator is a Reynolds number based on radius r, but uh, usually for uh, this type of geometry the length scale that is taken is 2 r or the diameter of the pipe. So, if you just consider that then the C f becomes 8 into 2 divided by rho v average into the diameter by mu, where diameter is 2 into r. So, this is 16 by the Reynolds number based on the diameter of the pipe. Now, what as engineers, what we want to do with this friction, friction coefficient. So, what uh, importance or implication it has to us. So, if it is large, it is small, we may understand that if it is large, maybe uh, the frictional effect is large, but how do we take care of that in a design? And that may be visualized more effectively if you consider now the dp star dz term which is equal to c. So, to do that let us come back to this equation v average written in terms of c. So, what is c? c is equal to dp star dz. So, let us write dp star dz in terms of the other parameters. So, it becomes minus 8 mu v average by r square. 
okay. So, minus 8 mu V average by R square and what is this dP star dz? This is if you have pressure at the inlet as say P in, if you have pressure at the outlet as say P out and the distance over which this pressure uh, difference is there is L, then first of all we could derive that d p star d z is a constant. That means p star versus z is a linear profile. So, this is as good as p star out minus p star in by L, okay. So, this we just write as p star out minus p star in by L. So, in other words it is minus of p star in minus p star out by L. I mean why we are writing it in this way is see the p star in minus p star out is the driving delta p star for the flow, the driving difference in piezometric pressure that should drive the flow. See why this driving pressure difference is necessary? It is necessary because you have viscous resistance in the flow. So, this is a manifestation of the consequence of the effect of viscous resistance that is being exerted in the flow. So, you have to have a driving pressure gradient which is a favorable pressure gradient that is dp star dz negative to make this flow occur. So, when you have this one, this delta p star, so what it in effect does? In effect, it overcomes the viscous resistance. So, the viscous resistance also may be expressed in form of a pressure unit. So, the viscous resistance therefore, you may say that delta p star is nothing but the delta p star because of the viscous resistance and we may write it in terms of a head or some unit of length. So, we remember that the pressure is nothing but some length unit into rho into g and the length unit is the equivalent unit of pressure expressed in terms of length with which we call as head. So, that is what we discussed also earlier. So, if we write it in terms of a head un length unit as head with a subscript h f for friction, f for friction, so we can write it h f rho g where this h f as engineers we understand that this is a loss of head due to fluid friction. Okay. Therefore, it is possible to write this expression dp star dz if we come back here in terms of this delta p star as hf rho g. So, you have hf rho g by L is equal to 8 mu V average by R square. Of course, it is possible to write it in terms of in terms of the diameter. So, it is <coughs> so eight becomes thirty two here. Okay. So it is also possible to write the average velocity in terms of the flow rate and that is sometimes important because if the flow rate is q, it is just q by pi d square by 4 uh, because in the experiment you usually measure the flow rate. So, uh, it is we are trying to write the equation in terms of experimentally measurable parameters. So, from this what you get is h f is equal to 128 mu q l by rho g pi d to the power 4, okay. And this equation is known as hagen poiseuille's equation. So, what it, what it gives? It gives a direct indication of the loss of head 
due to viscous effects in the flow. If the flow had viscosity 0, there would have been no loss of head and we can see that the loss of head is directly proportional to the flow rate. It is proportional to the length over which the fluid is flowing which is understandable and inversely proportional to the fourth power of the diameter. So, if you make the diameter very, very small, the loss of head will be very large. That means, to drive flow through a very small tube, say a tube of micron size, you require a huge pumping power because there is a huge head loss because of the frictional effects. That is one of the challenges in having a flow in a micro or a nano channel in a, in a very small channel. So, the whole understanding is that uh, like those are advanced topics, but you see that the basic of fluid mechanics gives us a clue that what are the challenges as you make the sides smaller and smaller, what are the engineering challenges in terms of having the flow. Now, it is also possible to express it in terms of a non-dimensional form by writing this in this way, by writing this as some factor f into L by D into V average square by 2G. So, this is just a non-dimensional way of writing it. See, L by D is a sort of aspect ratio of the pipe. It is a non-dimensional parameter. So, and V square by 2G is the kinetic energy head. So, the head loss expressed as a fraction of the kinetic energy head. This F is that sort of fraction. So, what is that? So, if you just equate these two, so you have H f as rho g rho uh, sorry f l by d v square by 2 g and that is equal to whatever expression of H f what we had. So, 32 mu b bar by d square l by rho g. So, from here what we can conclude what is f 64 divided by rho v bar into d by mu okay, by just by equating these two. So, that means this f becomes 64 by the Reynolds number. So, this uh, sort of non-dimensionalization was first introduced by an engineer known as Darcy. So, uh, this friction factor is also known as Darcy's friction factor. So, it is just a different way of writing the friction or frictional coefficient. You can see clearly that F and C F are related by F is equal to 4 into C F. So, just is the same thing expressed in terms of in different ways. So, one looks into it in the viewpoint of a pressure drop, another looks into it in the form of a wall shear stress and here they are related because you have to overcome the wall shear stress and therefore, you have a pressure drop. So, that is how they are related and this 4 coefficient is just because of the difference in which they are defined, but physically they imply the same. So, if it is Manning's friction factor that is C f and if it is uh, uh, Darcy's friction factor it is f. So, now uh, so, we have a clear idea that if we have flow through a pipe, uh, there is a head loss. The head loss is because of the viscous effects in the flow and you require a driving pressure gradient. The driving pressure gradient is to overcome an energy loss. The energy loss may be expressed in terms of a head and that head is given by this expression. So, that is what we learn and as engineer it is important because say you are given a length of the pipe. See. I mean, let us think about how this helps in design. Say you are given a length of a pipe, say 10 centimeter length of a pipe. You are given a flow rate that you expect out of it, say some, some meter cube per second. You know what is the viscosity of the fluid and density of the fluid like that. So, your problem is that what should be the power of that pump that is necessary to drive the flow. This is one of the very basic elementary problem. So, to know that you have to know that what is the pressure drop that is taking place and first of all if you find out what is the HF, what is the head loss over that length, then that into rho into G is the pressure drop and the pump should have enough power to overcome that. 
So, the pump should have a power that is developed that is given by rho g into q into the head loss, it has to overcome that loss. So, this is like a unit of power. So, if you know that what is the flow rate, if you know what is the head that the pump has to supply, then uh, you know that what is the power of the pump that is necessary. And so, uh, it comes into, so a very basic elemental mathematical work also is necessary even for a very crude uh, design work which is, uh, which is there in the day to day life of fluid mechanics like flow through pipes. Okay. Now, we come to another example, example 5 and uh, that will be like the <coughs> final example before we will be moving to the next chapter. So, the final example is about flow between two rotating cylinders, long rotating cylinders. This is a problem that we are going to revisit because this problem we introduced when we were discussing about viscosity and its measurement. So, you have two cylinders, concentric cylinders. Of radii R1 and R2. Let us say that the inner, inner cylinder is rotating with an angular velocity omega 1 and the outer cylinder is rotating with an angular velocity omega 2. And these angular velocities are like, uh, these are not functions of anything, these are constant angular velocities and we are considering a steady flow of a Newtonian fluid of constant properties which is, which are kept uh, and the fluid is kept in the gap between the two cylinders. This type of problem is important because we have discussed that it gives a principle of the measurement of viscosity of an unknown fluid. So, the principle of a device known as viscometer. So, we have earlier qualitatively used the one dimensional form of the Newton's law of viscosity to uh, like get an estimation of uh, what happens here. But now what we will do, we will try to do it in a more careful way by using the proper equations of motion. So, first of all we have to understand that what are the important variables which are involved here. So, again by the nature of the problem, the geometry of the problem, the cylindrical polar coordinate system seems to be a proper choice. So, the r theta z coordinate system. Okay. Now, the corresponding velocity components are there v r, v theta, v z. The first assumption that we will make is that the length of the cylinder which is perpendicular to the plane of the figure is very large. What is the consequence of making the length large? Large means large in comparison to the radius. So, if L is large, then what is the consequence in terms of your analysis? It effectively boils down to a two dimensional problem in the r theta plane. So, the z gradient is not important. So, when you come to the r theta component, you have v r and v theta, these things are there. Next is what about the partial derivatives with respect to theta? See, when you are solving a problem, it is not that the assumptions are given to you. It is important to come up with the assumptions based on the physical description of the problem. See, the inner cylinder rotates with an angular velocity which does not, does not have any preference over theta, right. It is not that at different theta it is different. The outer cylinder also rotates with an angular velocity that does not have any preference over any theta. And therefore, in between we expect that it whatever is the behavior should not have any preference over theta. So, that means the derivative with respect to theta for whatever the flow parameters that should be 0. So, that should automatically follow from the physical description of the problem. Next, uh, what we will do, uh, we will now go to the basic equations. Again, we will go to the cylindrical coordinate system uh, equations, Navier-Stokes equations, but first we will go to the continuity equation. 
So, if we go to the continuity equation, you see uh, we are talking about the continuity equation in the cylindrical polar coordinate system. First term, because we are considering the steady flow, the density uh, gradient uh, derivative that is 0 with respect to time. The second term, the second term is like if you want you should keep it. The third term and the fourth term, see because there is no derivative with respect to theta, the second term is 0, no gradient with respect to z, so that term is 0. So, only one term is r into v r, the derivative of that, that means d d r of r v r that is equal to 0, just like what we had for a uh, hagen poiseuille flow. And what will be the obvious conclusion that v r is not a r into v r or uh, v r is not a function of r. So, we know that at two different radii v r is 0, r equal to r 1 and r equal to r 2 and that is good enough for us to say that v r is equal to 0 for all r because v r is not a function of r. So, the problem has boiled down to only one velocity component that is v theta. Okay. So, with this understanding let us now go back to the momentum equations. So, let us look into the momentum equations first the r momentum equation that is the first equation written in the slide. So, you have v r equal to 0. So, all the terms in the left hand side are 0 except the term involving v theta. So, in the left hand side you have minus rho v theta square by r okay. and it, it is the centripetal effect. So, we may understand physically what it is. So, when it is a rotating thing it is a centripetal acceleration because of the tangential component of the velocity. Right hand side you have first term minus dp dr that term is there. The remaining terms first term has v r, so that is 0, second term have has again v r that is 0, third term again has v r and fourth term has the derivative with respect to theta, so that is 0, there is no body force along r. Okay. So, you have the r momentum equation what it gives? dp dr is rho v theta square by r. No, no, that is what I said that that is always a special case. So, you also have to satisfy the boundary conditions and consider it for all r or for all possible cases. v r proportional to 1 by r is only a special case, but we have to con you have to consider that it, it should be true for all possible velocity fields. It is not just for one one particular velocity field. Not only that you have to satisfy v r uh, say 0 at r equal to r 1 and r equal to r 2. So, if you have say r into v r as some constant c, so that is v r equal to c by r, then at r equal to capital R 1, how do you ensure that that v r will be 0? You have to ensure that the, at the boundaries you have normal component of velocity 0, so that you have to keep in mind. So, the r momentum equation you have d p d r as rho v theta square by r. Let us look into uh, the other momentum equation, see the z momentum equation is useless here because it involves all the terms which have v z and there is uh, the no body force along z and uh, only it gives that d p d z equal to 0 that is the z momentum equation only term that remains important is d p d z equal to 0. Okay. The most important momentum equation will be the theta momentum equation. So, theta momentum equation if you see that is the second equation written in the slide. First you go to the left hand side you have first the flow is steady. So, the first term is 0. Next you have v r is there, so v r into that is 0, third term 
derivative with respect to theta, so that term is 0. Fourth term, because v r is 0, that is equal to 0. Fifth term, v z is 0, so or, or even if you do not consider that, the gradient with respect to z is 0 because z is large. So, in either way, the left hand side totally becomes 0. Right hand side, first term d p d theta is 0 because there is no theta variation. Second term is very much there because you have v theta as a function of r which is we, which is what we are going to solve. Next term, it is a gradient with respect to theta, so that is 0. The term after that you have derivative with respect to z, that is 0. The next term you have v r that is 0 and you have no body force along theta. Therefore, it boils down to mu sorry theta momentum mu into let us write the terms 1 by r sorry yeah mu into 1 by r sorry d d r of d d r of 1 by r d d r of r v theta that is equal to 0 right. So, see now v theta could be function of what? v theta could be function of r theta and z. It is not a function of z because there is no gradient with respect to z, the length is large. v theta is not a function of theta because there is a there is no variation with respect to theta for anything. So, v theta is a function of r only and therefore, we may write it as an ordinary differential equation. So, we may just write it equivalently as d d r of 1 by r d d r r v theta is equal to 0. So, if we integrate it you will get d of 1 by r d d r of r v theta that means 1 by r d d r of r v theta is equal to say some c 1. So, r v theta is equal to c 1 or d of r v theta is c 1 r d r right. So, if we integrate it r v theta is equal to c 1 r square by 2 plus c 2 and v theta therefore, becomes c 1 r by 2 plus c 2 by r. So, it is like of the form a r plus b by r right. So, if you look into this equation, can you recall that the corresponding components of these velocities are related to the vortex flows that we have studied earlier. So, what is the first component that is like a forced vortex and this is free vortex or irrotational vortex. So, it is like a combination of free and force vortex that is going to be the resultant velocity field. Now, and if you want to get the pressure distribution, you have to go back to the r momentum equation to get the radial pressure distribution. So, you know now v theta as a function of r, you may substitute and integrate it with respect to r to get the pressure as a function of r. We are not going into that, but what we will do is we will find out what is the expression for the wall shear stress. So, we are interested in tau r theta or just shear stress at different locations. So, if you want to write, so there is an expression for tau r theta and I am just writing it down here and I will tell you that uh, what is the 
origin or rationale behind this expression. So, this is this is for a Newtonian fluid just written just express in, in terms of the r theta coordinate system. So, it is just like just think of two coordinates like if it was tau x y that was what mu right. So, basically you are having a cross gradient x component of velocity with y gradient and y component of velocity with x gradient. So, similarly you have a theta component of velocity with r gradient and r component of velocity with theta gradient and this 1 by r these adjustments are there because of the use of the cylindrical polar coordinate system. So, these adjustments are also quite obvious that if you have say this term. So, you have v r with respect to theta see you want a gradient that means it should be the velocity divided by a length. So, this is d theta. So, r d theta is like an elemental length in a cylindrical polar coordinate system. So, that is why 1 by r term has to come outside. So, in this way you uh, may relate this term with uh, with the general understanding of the curvilinear systems. So, uh, again it is it is not very important to go into the derivation of this term, but we will just utilize this to calculate the stress. So, if, if you now write this is mu r d d r of v theta by r. So, v theta by r is we have not yet completed the expression for v theta because a and b are two constants of integrations to be evaluated, but that we can straightforward do from the boundary condition. But at least let us look into the form first. So, v theta by r is a plus b by r square. Okay. So, v theta by r is a plus b by r square and therefore, d d r of v theta by r is minus b by r cube sorry minus 2 b by r cube. So, you have this as minus 2 b by r cube and theta derivative is not there. So, minus 2 mu b by r square. What is the, so one important thing is, is independent of theta, but dependent on r. The next thing is that what is the elemental shear force because of this. So, let if you consider an element at a radius r, you have a line element like this. Because it is independent of theta, otherwise you could have taken a small line element with r d theta, but because it is independent of theta, we are taking a total peripheral line element. So, what is the? elemental shear force on that. So, the shear force is f at a distance r is tau r theta into 2 pi r into L. So, 2 pi r is the perimeter of this times the length is the outer surface over which this tau r theta is tangentially acting. So, that becomes minus 2 mu b by r square into 2 pi r l. And what is the moment of this force with respect to the axis of the cylinders at a radius r that is f r into r. And you can clearly see that is equal to minus 2 pi mu b l which is independent of r. So, if you remember that while dealing with the understanding of the principle of viscometer, we said that same moment or torque is transmitted at all radius and this is what it shows that at, at any arbitrary radius, the torque which is there is in the, the shear torque, the torque due to the shear force is independent of the local radius. This is one of the very important understandings. Now, to find out the constants A and B, you have to use the boundary conditions. So, what are the boundary conditions? Let us just write the boundary conditions and try to find out A and B. So, 
So the boundary conditions are at r equal to r1 p theta is omega 1 into r1, no slip boundary condition. So velocity of the fluid same as velocity of the solid and at r is equal to r2 v theta is omega 2 into r2. So you substitute that, so omega 1 r1 is equal to a r1 plus b by r1 and omega 2 r2 is equal to a r2 plus b by r2. So it is possible to find out a and b from these two, right. Well, these are like capital as per our notations. So, A R 1 plus B by R 1, A R 2 plus B by R 2. Now, let us say that we want to solve a problem which is a bit of a modified version of this one. What is that modified problem? So, the modified problem is you have one single cylinder, solid cylinder rotating with an angular velocity omega in a fluid of large extent. So one cylinder of radius r and of large length rotating with omega, so there is no inner or outer concept. So how can you solve this problem by considering the solution of this one? So omega 1, so r 1 is equal to capital R, omega 1 equal to omega, r 2 tends to infinity and omega 2 equal to 0. So if you do that, let us see that what, what forms the constants of integration state for that particular case. So you have r, r 2 tends to infinity and omega 2 equal to 0. So when r2 tends to infinity this term is 0, omega 2 is 0 that means a equal to 0. So this will straight away give you a equal to 0 that means b is equal to omega into r square. So tau r theta in that case becomes minus 2 mu omega into r square by small r square. And what is the V theta there? V theta is just B by R because A is 0, so omega R square by R. So it has become like a pre vortex. We have seen earlier that a pre vortex flow is an irrotational flow, right? So that much we know that means the vorticity vector, if you calculate, that will be a null, ve null vector uh, that we showed by calculating the circulation and the vorticity. Now let us try to find out what is the shear force on the fluid and that is something which is very, very interesting. So we have calculated the shear force locally at a radius and maybe the torque due to that, but over the volume, what is the total shear force that is acting? To do that, what we will do is we will write the momentum equation just in a vector form. So the momentum equation is rho okay so this is a vector form we have derived this vector form and uh, the advantage with the vector form is whatever vector operation that we will be doing on it, so long as it is in a vector operation form, we do not explicitly mention which coordinate system it is. So it remains valid for all types of coordinate system. So the problem or the situation that we were looking for, in that particular situation, the left hand side was 0 always by the consideration of fully developed flow and steady flow. So this term was 0. and this term was 0 because of the sort of either fully developed or maybe 0 gradients in certain directions, say theta or z direction or for whatever reason, the left hand side always came to be 0 for the example that we were talking about. So in the vector form also it is like that. 
So, you have the gradient of p is equal to mu into this. Now, let us try to use this particular term and see this is what this is basically a force per unit volume, right. So, if we want to find out that what is the force per unit volume because of viscous effects, this is the term that is coming into the picture, okay. So, this you can say that is the F per unit volume mu into this. Now, what we will do is let us say we want to take the curl of both sides or just by looking into another way, let us try to find out this term. I mean we may take a curl of this side, uh, this and do, but, but yet let us just look into this. So, we want to take the curl of the curl of the velocity vector. So, that is given by the vector identity. So, in this vector identity, let us now try to use this vector identity. So, what we will do is, we will consider an incompressible flow. So, incompressible flow. When you are considering an incompressible flow, what is the consequence of that? You have the divergence of the velocity vector equal to 0, okay. So, when you have divergence of the velocity vector 0, then you have the del square v is equal to minus of curl of curl of v, right. And curl of v is the vorticity vector, right. Therefore, you can write that del square v is equal to minus curl of the vorticity vector, where the zeta is the vorticity. Okay. So, the, our, this force that is mu del square v, therefore, we can write this as mu minus mu into curl of the vorticity vector. So, this is what? This is the viscous force per unit volume, right. So, this is shear force per unit volume. It does not matter whether it is sim the equation is simplified to this form or not. Even if the left hand side all the terms are there, still this happens to be the viscous force per unit volume. So, this particular term. So, only these terms were simplified to this extent for the problems that we discussed, but for all problems it will not be like that. But for all problems for a Newtonian fluid with a constant viscosity, this is going to be the viscous force per unit volume. Now, you look into this special case. So, this for this free vortex, we know that it is an irrotational flow. So, that means curl of the velocity vector is 0 that means the vorticity vector is a null vector. So, that means this term is 0. Okay. So, you see an example if you recall one of our very introductory lectures in fluid mechanics we mentioned one thing that fluid mechanics is a beautiful subject because it gives something which is non intuitive and this is one example. You have shear stress not equal to 0, but shear force equal to 0. If you recall, we mentioned this as an this as a non-intuitive example that you have shear stress not equal to 0, right. This is this is B is not equal to 0, it is varying with the radius, but you now find that because of the irrotationality, the shear force is 0.
with this example one of the very non intuitive things we learn out of fluid mechanics that there may be cases where the shear stress is not 0, but the shear force is 0 and uh, that we can get from very elementary mathematical consideration of this type of flow. So, uh, to summarize we have uh, looked into examples uh, of exact solutions of the Navier Stokes equations mostly for steady flows, we have not done it for unsteady flows that is not there in the purview of this elementary course, but at least for steady flows and uh, fully developed types of flows we have worked out the solutions and we have come to a uh, conclusion that simple closed form solutions of Navier Stokes equations are possible for such types of flows and uh, these give rise to certain important insights from engineering and scientific principles. So, uh, we will conclude this chapter here and uh, from the next lecture we will start with another important facet of the equations uh, of motion for viscous flows and that is the turbulent flows. So, we will start with the introduction of turbulence from the next lecture. Thank you.